welcome to the podcast for Healing Neurology, where we talk about everything that can help heal your neurology, which is really everything from food, lifestyle, and medicine to nature, culture, and politics. There's no topic too big or too small. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner certified in Ayurveda and functional medicine. And we have the incredible Kelly Kasperson here with us today. She is a board certified urologist in private practice in Washington state. She's the host of the You Are Not Broken podcast, which we'll talk quite a bit about today, and teaches women about their body, sex, and the power of the mind in living your best love life. Her mission is to empower other women to take control of their lives using the power of coaching and mind work to change sex lives and put women back in the power seat. You can find her and sex education classes at kellycaspersonmd.com and on Instagram at instagram.com backslash kellycaspersonmd and find her Facebook page at facebook.com backslash you are not broken. So welcome, Kelly. We're so happy to have you. Thanks for having me. Pretty fun, pretty fun topic. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the only, one of the only topics where everybody's supposed to be an expert and nobody got any education on it. Well, yeah, that and parenting. These are kind yeah, of the that areas. Yeah, parenting, <laughs> totally. And maybe money. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's very true also. But this is the body we live in. So you've had a really interesting path here from a board certified urologist where really you're a surgeon, like you work in the deep in the anatomy and physiology of women's bodies. And now you have a business and a podcast and a program all around You Are Not Broken. So tell us a little bit about this transition. Yeah, it's been an awesome journey. So urology is genital urinary organs and kidneys. And we really learned a lot about men and we learned a lot about men's sexual function and Viagra and all the things and how the penis works. And really nobody was taking care of the women. So Viagra has been around for over 20 years and women would literally come back into the office and like hand the Viagra back to the clinic and be like, what do you want me to do with this? Which is a sign that everybody's neglecting the people that the guys with Viagra are sleeping with, right? Yes. And so here I am thinking like gynecology is the one that's supposed to take care of it. And they really don't get training in female sexual health either. You know, we ask them to do so much from like delivering the babies to doing the birth control, to dealing with menopause, like they're already full too, right? So urology really is, since we already deal with the men's parts, the place where we deal with the women's. And I look at vulvas all day long because I'm dealing with incontinence and prolapse and all the pelvic issues as a surgeon. And the more and more I started talking to women about their function, realizing it's not really the pelvis's fault. And sometimes it is with pain and with some issues, but a lot of times it's our biggest sex organ, which is our mind. Mm -hmm. That's really the big limiting belief for women to, to enjoy their sex life. Now the pelvis, you know, certainly has, shouldn't be neglected, but more and more it's really about the brain and women just not understanding how their bodies work or what we call sex positive sex education. We just didn't get it. And so I started this podcast because over and over again, I kept repeating, you're not broken. Your, your labia is completely normal. Your responsive sexual desire, completely normal. You know, that it takes you longer to have an orgasm than a man, totally normal. <laughs> so like all this, all these normal facts that we just don't know is where the title for the podcast came from. It's like, we're more normal than we know. We just never were told that. There's my story in, in a nutshell sounds like you noticed even in school, even in medical school, that there was kind of a, like a dearth of information around women's bodies and their function. Yeah. And I think for several reasons, you know, everybody else thought everybody else was supposed to be the expert at it. Like in in, in urology is male dominated. Mm -hmm. We have about eight percent board certified female now so it's like if the the men are dealing with the men nobody's really there's no women around plus we i was taught that women are complicated women's sexual function is complicated and kind of using that as an excuse of oh we'll never know you know we haven't figured it out yet it's kind of beyond what we are capable of and it is very different than Viagra. I mean, men really do are more of a light switch mentality uh, mm-hmm. than a female sexual function is. But again, now I just look at it as an excuse. So like nobody's, nobody was taking care of the women. How do you take care of women? What do you do? Well, How do you talk about this? First, just normalizing their experience, right? Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of us live in isolation and shame and thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one that has this issue because again, I'm broken. And really saying these are really common things that tons of women struggle with they just don't have any resources to go to again why my podcast is i'm like i need to provide a resource for women to be like oh my gosh she is talking about what is going on in my life so really just normalizing it and then if they come 
to something and they're, they complain about it, right? Like, oh, it just takes me longer to have an orgasm than my partner. It's like, well, that's just a fact. I can't change a fact. Like women will take 30 to 40 minutes to have climax where a man, a man at the start of vaginal intercourse usually orgasms within three to five minutes. Uh-huh. That's just anatomy. So uh-huh. just nor- normalizing so much of it and then acknowledging the role of the brain in people's sexual health. Let's start talking just because I think some of us are still strangers to our anatomy. What I love are those images of the pelvic floor and just how many muscles, like how many things happen in the pelvic floor. Can you talk to us a little bit about the anatomy? Like what do we actually have down there? So I always say women have three holes. <laughs> we have a urethra, a vagina, and a rectum. Uh-huh. And, and things have to happen through those holes, right? So we have to urinate, we have to have babies or have sex, and then we have to poop. Uh-huh. And so to hold those organs in, the bladder, the uterus, the rectum, we have to have a pelvic floor. And that's a bunch of muscles that act as a bowl. And so that bowl can get weakened with weight gain, chronic straining, decrease in muscle tone, or just decrease in muscle in general after menopause. So the pelvic floor really plays an important role of keeping the organs in, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, letting things pass out. So if you you can have dysfunction in both of them. Um, And then we have the one and only organ in any human body that is solely responsible for pleasure pleasure and that's the clitoris. It's only job is pleasure. Uh-huh. And then now people, you know, cause I know what people think now and they're like, but what about the penis? And it's like, <laughs> no, the penis is its only job is not pleasure. It has to urinate and it also has to uh, impregnate a female. So, so sperm has to travel through it. So the penis actually has three jobs. Yeah. Whereas the clitoris only job is pleasure. So we have it for a reason yeah. because our body develops that this is worth having pleasure for. So it's just a very cool way of thinking about the clitoris. When we think about the clitoris, what you see from the outside is different from what's inside. So it kind of looks like a, a wishbone. And fortunately now there's some, you know, you can actually Google to look at a clitoris, but a lot of people didn't have that anatomy before. Certainly I am like, do you remember it's like third grade sex education? Women's anatomy was usually explained in internal sexual organs. So usually they say vagina, uterus, and ovaries. Huh? And no mention to the vulva, the labia, and the clitoris. Yes. And the vulva, the labia, and the clitoris are all important sexual pleasure organs. And our organs in their own, like everybody, all women, you know, if they don't know about their vulva, they just call everything a vagina. Right. Which technically the vagina is the inner part after the vulva becomes the vagina and it's the tube that connects the cervix and uterus to the vulva. Yeah. And when I was in third or fourth grade and had our first sex education class, I literally thought the uterus was connected to the opening of the vagina. Like I did not realize that there was a vaginal vault. I had no, it was really just cut right off there at the bottom of the uterus. Yeah. So, I mean, no wonder women don't know their anatomy is because we actually got an education, but it was all internal organs. The uh, the clitoris wraps around the inside on both sides, kind of like a wishbone. So what you can actually see is just like the tip of the iceberg, literally. And so that tip of the iceberg is the clitoral glands, and it has its own kind of foreskin equivalent. So it has shaft skin. And what's really important for people to know is sometimes it's hard for females to have pleasure just with classic penis and vagina sex, PIV sex is what they call it, (laughs) because of the lack of clitoral stimulation. So if you're having sex near the clitoris, but the clitoris is what's important for orgasm, now it makes perfect sense why you're not having orgasms during sex. So anatomy is super important. Why is the clitoris not closer to where something enters the vagina? Because maybe penis and vagina sex shouldn't be the default, <laughs> right? I think it's this very male-centric view of the world of like, mm-hmm. well, if the penis is supposed to go in the vagina, why didn't we put the clitoris closer to the, where the penis and the vagina are? It's uh-huh. like, maybe women should be doing other things to have pleasure, like not thinking that we're broken because we mm-hmm. didn't put our pleasure center next to where the man's pleasure center goes. Yeah. I love thinking about it that way and not yeah. thinking that we have a flawed design, but instead thinking yeah. like- No, yeah, our design is- Amazing. It's perfect. Well, you know, and it is really complicated. So I remember at one point looking at like as an adult interested in healthcare, looking at all like it was like a book of like 50 different vulvas and just the idea of how different they can look. 
Penises are the same way, right? Like women are like, oh, my vulva, blah, blah. It's like men have the same issue with their penises. Like we yeah. we just have society like somehow has told us that we are all, you know, shamefully misshapen. But vul- vulvas are literally <laughs> like fingerprints and snowflakes. There's an artist who did like a vulva wall, which uh-huh. was very cool because it's like your labia can come more outward than inward. They can be different sizes. They can be different colors. It's just, hey, we're just all snowflakes and all of it's good. If you're having pain, that's not good. But other than that, your anatomy is pretty good. I had a woman, she came in and she's like, oh, I just hate the way my vulva and my labia look in the swimsuits. And I'm like, well, I do look at tons of vulvas. So I'll just put you on a bell curve and kind of tell you where you are. And, and, and she's like, great. And I'm like, you're perfectly normal. You're at the top of the bell curve. I'm like, do you think it might not be your labia that's the problem, but it might be the material of the swimsuit? Let's stop yep. thinking that we're the broken ones, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's our anatomy. Let's talk about one of the things that you had said as we were talking about doing this podcast, which is that the biggest sex organ is the brain. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So our brain is our master ship, right? And so if our brain is busy thinking about what has happened in the past or what's going to happen tomorrow in the future, our sexual response won't work as well. Our sexual response works the best when we're really being mindful in the moment getting into the pleasure, getting into our body sensations. And women, and I think more than men, not just to horrifically gender stereotype all the time, but women really do have a brain that kind of is in a lot of places. We have to keep a lot of balls floating in the air. And it can be a really big challenge because if we're thinking about the kids' lunch needing to be packed and a presentation at work at the end of the week, we're not going to, we're going to wonder why it's so hard to have an orgasm, right? Whereas our body really wants to know it's safe. There aren't any animals out there that are going to attack us. And now is the time to have pleasure. But if our brain's kind of cycling over something, it's you're not going to be able to have as much experience. So mindfulness and being in the present is really important for sexual health. As a urologist, what are some of the discussions that you've had with patients around these topics? Like what are questions that, how do women bring these questions? How do they experience this? Yeah. I I mean, for me, luckily, I think people know I talk about this a lot more so they can come saying this is an issue. But a lot of times for people, it'll be like the last thing when they go see a provider is like, oh, and by the way, I'm having pain with sex or, or, oh, and by the way, my thought to that is two things. Number one, it's really hard to talk to a stranger or provider about your sex life. Like I totally get it, but give yourself all the time for the visit and don't have it be at the very end or be like, I'd like to make an appointment to talk specifically about this because if you just save it for the very end of the appointment, it's not going to get the time it deserved. And you, it, you're more likely to kind of just not get a good workup for it or kind of blown off. So the first thing I talk about is just pain and hormones because a lot of women come in now talking about desire and libido and they have, it turns out they have pelvic pain, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like, well, we don't enjoy anything that's painful. So why would we enjoy painful sex? Right? So it's like, we can't fix libido and desire and until we fix the pain issue. So, and then number two on that, because the low libido is really what bring a lot of women in and you end up realizing it's not really a low libido, right? It's something else. It's either pain. Another common one is boredom. Mm -hmm. So you're just having super boring sex. So you're not desiring it. Or the other thing is, uh, is orgasmic inequality sex. So like I have sex, but it's just for him. He gets off and that, but I, and then you wonder why you don't want to have sex. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's you're having you're having like low quality sex. And my analogy for that is like I freaking love Hagen Dazs mint chip ice cream. Like Uh I (laughs) I could eat it every day. I would eat it for lunch. Like I love it. If you Uh give it to me melted, I won't eat it. And you can't make me like melted ice cream. Uh huh. Right. So no matter like how many hormones you optimize or any the use, I still won't like melted ice cream. Yeah. So it's like you can't wonder where the low libido comes from if the sex that you're trying to have is unsatisfying to you. Yeah. I love picking that stuff apart. So good. So good. So good. It's a great analogy. It's not any one particular thing. It's the gestalt of your level, of your presence, your presence of mind, and it goes back to that mindfulness piece. And, and prioritizing your pleasure. I think a lot yeah. of women, if they're like, oh, well, I don't usually have an orgasm. And then they're like, I have a low libido. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> you're having crappy sex. <laughs> <laughs> what do you tell women who are having crappy sex? What are your recommendations? How do you go about looking at that? Yeah. Oh, it, it's so it's so fun, right? So, so fun. you have to talk to your partner about it and take your power back. Cause I think so many women are like, I just don't have an orgasm with him. He doesn't know how, like we're giving the guy all the, all the power in this. And it's like, he, well, he didn't take a class on this, right? Uh We think we have a bad sexual education. They did too. It's not their 
fault any more than it is ours, right? So kind of, comp- I have compassion for the guy too, of like, uh-huh. he's probably doing the best he can. So you got to communicate and be, and make it a very much like, hey, you know what? I'm really interested in maybe having a little more enjoyment with sex and make it in a very much like me, I, and we Instead mm-hmm. of like, you're not giving me orgasms. <laughs> I can tell you all not to talk about it. Um, and then, you know, talk about it ideally like at the, at the breakfast table and not when you're naked. Uh-huh. Having sex. It's like make it a, a very neutral thing. And I always tell people, blame me. Be like, I listen to this podcast where you know it actually takes a woman like normally like 30 minutes to have an orgasm. I guess I'm pretty normal. Uh-huh. Let's focus on that some more. You know? So it's like... <laughs> Instead of being like, oh, I just, you know, I have troubles with orgasms because he usually comes first is like, no, 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 no. Right. You probably are fine with orgasms. Right. Just prioritize your pleasure first so that you have more enjoyable sex. When we talk about pain with sex, what are some of the reasons that women might be having pain with sex? Yeah. Again, I always try to be like, not to say it's complicated. We're not complicated. You just need to talk to somebody who can kind of pick through it with you. A very, very common one is lack of lubrication. Mm -hmm. And this happens more and more in the perimenopause, postmenopause, when lack of estrogen literally dries out the tissue. But friction can hurt and a good lubrication is good for any sexually active person, whether they're in their 20s, 30s, or 70s. And I think a lot of people's belief of like, oh, I shouldn't need a lubrication. And (laughs) what's common and what's normal is desire kind of arousal mismatch where, hey, I really want to have sex. I'm into it, but I just don't have enough moisture. That's a very normal thing that happened to pelvises. Mm -hmm. And so just adding a lubrication, I had one lady and she's like, my boyfriend said I shouldn't need lube. And she was having pain with sex. I'm I'm like, well, maybe find somebody who thinks lube's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like, why did we give the guy the power? Why did we say, oh, well, he's right on not needing lube. It's like, no, if your body needs a little more moisture so it doesn't have pain, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a huge industry for a reason. And, and, you know, they've done studies, 80% of Americans use lube during sex. So that's number one is just like, especially since now we know women can take 20 to 30 minutes of Mm -hmm. some sort of stimulation is like you're gonna might want to use some lube it just helps with the friction Mm -hmm. um now the pelvic floor the muscles that we talked about those can be tight just like we get tight shoulders or tight backs Mm -hmm. and so having something in the vagina can be very very uncomfortable if Mm -hmm. you have muscles that are super tight so that's another reason for it there's also vulvar skin conditions um vulvodynia and some tightening of the skin lichen sclerosis so there's a lot of different reasons to have pain with sex but the easy ones that you really don't, don't need to see a doctor for is try lube and then also understanding going back to anatomy when a woman's pelvis is ready for intercourse or for ready for penis and vagina sex the vagina with arousal will actually lengthen open up and tilt back a little bit Mm -hmm. so if you put a penis in the vagina too soon you're way more likely to have pain either pain hitting the cervix because your your vagina hasn't taken the time to lengthen and pain with just the vagina not being in an accepting state so don't rush it Uh, that's another common reason for pain. And so let's talk a little bit more about the role of hormones. Yeah, hormones. I love it. (laughs) You know, I think for the last 10 years, women have really been scared off of estrogen because the media really took the Women's Health Initiative, which is this really big study looking at risks of estrogen and progesterone. And we know now that that study was flawed and maybe told us things that weren't accurate to all women. But point being, society has a big scare of estrogen, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll ask women, I'll be like, well, where'd you get this scare of estrogen from? Because the, their rule or they, what they think is just estrogen causes cancer. Mm-hmm. And it's like estrogen doesn't just cause cancer and it's, you know, it's complicated. But yep. so, but they don't know where they, they, they got that from. They just know it like it's a fact, like estrogen causes <laughs> cancer. So I have to kind of always talk about that before I can give people es- vaginal estrogen works great for tightness and, and dryness after um, menopause. Yeah. Um, We also think testosterone, which a lot of women don't think we even have testosterone. We literally have more testosterone than estrogen, but it's just, you know, it's measured different. Mm -hmm. Um, That goes away after menopause too. Our ovaries stop making testosterone. And Mm -hmm. testosterone we think is important in sex drive and libido. But Mm -hmm. I always say this with caveats of like, don't go look to, you know, optimize your testosterone when you haven't worked on your brain, your relationship, Mm -hmm. kind of all of the other pieces that go into it. What are, are there different recommendations that you make kind of pre-menopausal versus post-menopausal for different ways for women to use their bodies? Use their bodies like with sex or Mm -hmm. hormones? Yeah. I think whatever feels good, it's all about pleasure. And they kind of talk about being the, the sexual mind is dumb and happy. (laughs) 
getting into that like dumb and happy, really focused in the moment. And some people will say pleasure is the goal. And I really like that. And then some people will say, take the orgasm out of it. Like it is yeah. literally just a bonding experience to enjoy your body, to enjoy your partner's body. So there, and I don't think they're both great ways to think about sex. But I, I think the, um, they call the pity sex or something of just like, uh, well, he wants to, so I will. You Don't wonder where your libido is if that's the quality of sex that you're having. Yeah. And it's more common um, for women to have, for desire to develop after arousal starts, correct? Yeah, totally. So arousal is sometimes what's needed for a woman to be like, oh, wait, hold on. I'm interested in sex now. <laughs> right. And, and that's perfectly normal. And, and I think where a lot of women, once they have that knowledge, then they'll start getting into sexual activity with knowing that I'm going to enjoy the party once I get to the party. And I love that the party analogy, because it's like, I had a full week of work. I've got kids. I'm not going to go out looking for a party, right? Mm -hmm. The couch mm -hmm. looks good with a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. but you're like, my friend took me to this party. I didn't really want to go. But then I'm like, the music was good. They had great wine. Like, thank God I went to that party. Right? <laughs> so it's kind of that with like the with, with libido of like, you might not be seeking it out, but it doesn't mean you can't have a good time once you're there. And that's totally normal. Tell us a little bit more about the role that you see trauma playing in women's sexual experience, because certainly that impacts both the brain and the body. And certainly for many women who have had early sexual trauma, their pelvis may not be a safe place. Absolutely. So important. And this is where I really bring in my sex therapist, which I'm, mm -hmm. my town is very, very blessed to have sex therapists to help people process that. And I think processing is a really a nice way of saying it of like, some people are like, I just wish I could get over that. And it's like, mm -hmm. it might not be something to get over. It might be, you know, our bodies have memories, yeah. um, but certainly our belief about that memory and what it means to current sexual experiences is what can be improved on. Because a lot of people will carry those beliefs of like, I'm not worthy, I'm dirty, or it's unsafe. Um, and therapists are fantastic working through that. Some of the recommendations I've made to patients over the years is to practice having just naked sexy time so that you have time enjoying each other's bodies without on a timer, like literally set a timer for 20 minutes so that it's not like you have to go until one person says like, are, are, can we be done yet? Or are you done yet? Or is this enough for you that you have? you can have all the various emotions that you have in a sexual experience within a time frame so that it's open because we I think we also have the impression that you should always feel romantic during sex. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Steven Snyder, so he's an MD who's also a sex therapist so and a man, which is an amazing perspective that we're kind of <laughs> lacking in this world. Um, he talks about the two-step. And so the two-step is just like what you said, is like, we're just going to get in bed and be naked. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to enjoy your body. Mm -hmm. And now you're just going to enjoy my body. Mm -hmm. And like, it might not lead to, to classic penis and vagina intercourse, but it's another way of saying, maybe what we're doing is, is supposed to be in this kind of loving, enjoying each other. What an honor to be able to be naked with you mm -hmm. and kind of looking at sex in that way, instead of like, this is just something that, you know, what am I doing this for? Right? <laughs> like, instead, like take the goal out of it. And just yeah. be like, I am so blessed to be able to have this body to share with you and that you are able to share with me. And let's just enjoy each other for what that's worth without any end point in mind. That's so interesting how you're saying it, because really, I think there is still this idea that the ideal goal is that each partner climaxes together at exactly the same moment. Like somehow that's the best sex. Yeah. I love but, that because that's Hollywood, right? That is like, so Hollywood funny. has totally taught us how to have sex. And I, and I use that analogy a lot because one of my, one of the, I think the classic uh, simultaneous orgasm in two minutes movies is um, Reality Bites with Winona Ryder and mm -hmm. Ethan Hawke, right? Uh -huh. And uh -huh. like, I, when I grew up, that was like the epitome of sexiness it was like <laughs> Ethan Hawke. And I use that analogy now because I'm like, that was it for me. I was like, why can't I date Ethan Hawke? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, he was unemployed. He rarely showered. <laughs> He smoked like he's not attractive to me at all anymore. Right. And, and I think what that analogy is not just that Hollywood teaches us that sex actually happens in a way it doesn't is like what used to work for us sexually might not work for us now that we have full time jobs, kids and we're 45. Yeah. And that's OK, because women will be like, why can't it just be like when I was 18? Because it can't. 
<laughs> like, your mind is not the same right, as it was like, at 18. Do we want 18 year olds running this world? No, we want 45 <laughs> year olds running this world. Right? Yes. And so it's like just the acceptance of what worked for our body then with like raging testosterone and absolutely no responsibilities in life mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. might not work for us now. And that's perfectly okay. And so that would be the goal too, that as we age with our partners, that our partners, that we each stay current to the other sexual needs and and emotional needs and social and physical needs that, and I think that is one of the things that keeps us awake in sex, that keeps sex not boring, is that if you're awake to the human being you're with now, the human being you're with now is a totally different person than they were even last week, potentially. So, you know, that idea that it's really sexy to have sex with strangers might actually be true for you. You might have a new person before you. So learning their body now, having them learn your new body is a way to keep it interesting. Yeah. And I think it reframes, you know, the whole thing about desire and long-term relationships right? Mm-hmm. And Esther Perel does a really nice job of it of like, how do you create the desire? Because we don't desire things that are common, repetitive, you know, like I have a pencil next to me, like I don't desire, it's not novel, right? Yes. So my yes. brain's like, whatever, I, it's always yes. here. And yeah. we can do the same thing for our partners instead of thinking of like, hey, here's this person that wasn't here yesterday and he did something different today that, you know, he's never done before. And isn't that curious? I get to see a new side. And and what if he's not here tomorrow? Yeah. And, you know, and kind of all the things that we do, and I don't mean to say trick our brain, it's really more to realize how incredibly lucky we are for having the people in our lives. My Ayurvedic teacher, Dr. Vasant Ladd, used to talk about the sunset this way, the idea that we live you know, every day of our life ends with a sunset. And there are times that we can take to appreciate that sunset. And if that sunset doesn't even know that we're necessarily appreciating it or not appreciating it, but it's just doing its thing. But when we can really drop in and lock in with our mindfulness, then every sunset can be a miracle, can be something to be appreciated, even though it's repeated every single day. Oh, so good. <laughs> so- I, love, I love it. <laughs> So let's have sex like that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I need to have sunset sex today. He'll be like, what? Yeah, yeah. And as I'm thinking about it, you know, thinking about Ethan Hawke and Winona Ryder, I'm trying to think of one movie that I've seen. And I'm, you know, this might not, uh, I'm not a huge movie person. So maybe there's out there that I don't know. But I've seen movies in which two partners orgasm together. And I've seen movies in which one pleasures the other so that the one being pleasured orgasms. And then it seems like they both stop. So I have yet to see where one person has an orgasm and they keep going and then the other person orgasms and they're both happy with it. And maybe there's a bunch of movies like that out there, but I cannot think of one scene I've seen. I know, right? Good point. Hollywood doesn't always have to show reality. (laughs) I know. Even with all that reality television out there, we need better representations. (laughs) Totally. What else can we discuss in terms of how we move forward from here? We've kind of established what doesn't work and some things to think about how it can or should. How do we get there? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I think the brain is the first step of like, because even our beliefs that we tell ourselves like, well, I haven't had orgasm before, so I'm probably not going to now. You know, it's the way we talk to ourselves and the way that we tell our body what the rules are, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that women do a lot of is they worry about what another person might think about their body. Boy, does that kill sex drives. The worry that we make about what other people think, that's affecting our sex. It's really not really affecting the way they're having sex. So we should stop doing that to ourselves. So I think the brain comes first. The other thing for women is don't expect anybody else to be good at giving you an orgasm if you don't know what is good for you giving you an orgasm. You know, and again, Mm -hmm. it's understanding your machinery. And I think this like, you know, putting the power back into your partner versus into you of our society really tells us that masturbation is wrong. I wish there was another word because even me saying masturbation, I know that I'm like, some people are like, oh, the word, you know, because it's really a strong word in our society of of shame and things that we were told we weren't supposed to do, right? So if you're not supposed to do the thing that gives you the knowledge to have pleasure. And remember the clitoris is only there for pleasure. That's all it's built for. Like how how lucky are we? (laughs) Um, But if we don't have the knowledge of what, Hey, well, I think this feels good. Don't put the power in somebody else to try to figure it out. It's, that's not nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I have a lot of sympathy for the guy, right? And I think the other thing a lot of women do, and I think it's worth talking about, is faking orgasm. Mm-hmm. So what you're doing is you're reinforcing behavior that isn't working for you. And you're also reinforcing to yourself that, see, sex isn't enjoyable and I just need it to end. And taking the ownership of doing that because you're like, well, he didn't give me an orgasm. 
It's yeah. like you need to take ownership for the faking of the orgasm, which is really hard to do, right? It's a pattern that women get in. But again, having that conversation in a way that can say, you know what, I've been doing stuff that I don't think is benefiting me. Mm-hmm. Let's take time. Can I would like to take time to try to you know, untangle this knot? Because I always say like ways that you shouldn't do it. You're not giving me an orgasm, so I'm you no know, like it's yeah. not. He doesn't know you're you're giving him feedback, right? Yeah. Um, and so breaking the fake orgasm, and again, where women think, oh, an orgasm is how I get sex to end, right? Yeah. Or faking yeah. one is like, yeah. sex doesn't have to have an orgasm. Um, but if that is your goal, let's work on that being your goal. But certainly, faking it is you're just kind of giving uh, feedback for behavior that nobody that's that's not good and untangle that knot if you're untangled untangle seeing sex and intimacy and relationships as a knot that we untangle is um an amazing way to recognize the complexity but also the possibility because i think that's part of the part of the rift of complex is we women and women's bodies and women's pelvic floors are very complex, but that doesn't make women's bodies or women's emotions or women's orgasm unknowable. It just makes it more interesting, I'd say. Yeah. I think the other thing I say a lot for women is like, they go around thinking desire is like this lost kitten, right? That's Uh my analogy is like, I need to go to the expert to find the lost kitten. And then once I find the kitten, then I have the things and then the relationship will be fine. It's like, desire is not something that's lost that you then have and you keep it on your nightstand. Like desire is something that a one might argue is not necessary whatsoever for a satisfying sex life, which again, will like, because everybody just thinks, oh, I have low desire. And it's like some, some of the experts think that desire, just throw it out. Like, why are we even looking for something to make us want sex? Like sex sex should be sex within just for sex's sake. Why do you need to have to like have some, right? So I think this big thing and we're kind of medicalizing female sexual health, which is great because we're talking about it. But if we just tell women that low sexual desire, we need to give you high desire. Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. If you're like, yeah, high desire, like I had in high school, you're like, but we don't want those people running the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay that we're not seeking out sex 80% of the time, right? <laughs> and if you are, then I mean, that it's not good nor bad, but it's just not everybody's necessary mission all the time. Yeah. 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 Again, going back to you are not broken. Like if you don't, if you're not actively seeking out sex, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you're not broken. Dr. Keisha Ewers, who we've had on the show before, who has her PhD in sexology, you know, one of the things she says is that between her and her husband, she said this on the show before, that they have a fairly open and honest relationship. So she can tell when her husband's interested in sex because she'll find him vacuuming. You know, that the kind of the things that turn us on are very, very different. <laughs> I love that. There's there's actually data. So we did a study uh, and the conclusion was men who do dishes have more sex. Oh, yeah. So Can you just say that one more time. Right. So men who do dishes have more sex. Right. And, and if you break that down, you're like, how, how is that? Why does that work? Is number one, you're taking the brakes off of a woman's sex drive. So if we think of sex drive as brakes and accelerators, is you're saying, you know what, I'm taking care of part of this. So you don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. The second reason is equality in a relationship where in a lot of relationships, the woman has the burden of doing a lot of the housework. Mm -hmm. So if she sees that there's an equality in the partnership, she's a lot more, she kind of feels a little more fulfilled Mm -hmm. um, or that the burden's not all on her. And then if you go into love languages, which I love talking about love languages, that's an act of service for love language people. Mm -hmm. And so to see somebody doing an act of service for you can be super sexy for people who have that as their love language. Can you tell us a little bit more about love languages? Yeah. So love languages, I think it's been around for like 30 years now. And there's five love languages. Uh, Let's see if I can remember them all. But so it's acts of service, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts. I always miss one because it's not mine. We'll have to Google uh, love languages. But there's so there's five of them. Uh And the cool thing about love languages is once you and your partner figure out the love, what each other's love languages are. Uh Uh-huh start to understand like that's why you doing the dishes is so amazing for me Uh or you telling me that I'm a good mother which is a words of affirmation is amazing for me Mm -hmm. and really filling up people's love cups so that they know that they're loved oh touch number five touch yeah (laughs) 
That's not my love language. For the surgeon. For the yeah, exactly. person who knows the anatomy the best. Totally. So a uh, touch, and they don't mean sexual touch. They, they really mean sexual touch, not as a love language, but just hugging, cuddling, uh, pats on the back, holding hands mm-hmm. um, for sex. They're like, oh, guys must all be, you know, touch. If they're <laughs> sex. It's like, no, that's not how, they, they take the sex part out of it uh-huh. and just be like, how do you connect? How do people tell you that, that they're, you're meaningful to them? Uh-huh. But I think speaking each other's love language is very, very good for sex. Let's say these love languages one more time. So words of affirmation. So that is talking to someone. You're you're an amazing mom. You're great at your job. I just love language, words of affirmation. I love it. Acts of service. Acts of service, washing dishes, vacuuming, packing somebody's lunch. Playing with kids, occupying kids. Receiving gifts. Somebody bringing you a trinket from their trip, uh, a necklace. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive, but just like, hey, I, I found this beautiful leaf at the park. I thought you'd enjoy that. A token. Letting somebody know that they've been thought of at a mm-hmm. different time and that now here's a indication of that. Quality time. Yep. So just spending quality time together. Yep. So without I, phones. Yep. You know, I just can... want to hang out with you all weekend long and do nothing. Yeah. That is a oh. quality time person. <laughs> And physical touch. So we just talked about that physical touch and cuddling and holding hands and, you know, not sexual touch, but just physical touch. Yeah. I think the other reason that love language is so important to understand is especially for men, sex is a very uh, big component of intimacy for them. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always for women. Women can be very intimate in other ways, right? Like sharing something with you that I know nobody else knows or just, you know, quality time or a love language. Mm -hmm. So when sex goes away for whatever reason, uh, maybe pregnancy, maybe a cancer diagnosis, maybe some erectile dysfunction, is keeping ways to keep the partnership intimate when you don't have that sex activity like you used to have. And I think it's important to recognize that for many men, having sex can be something that they're interested in, but not the only way that they, not even part of the love language that they speak. So you may be having sex with your husband, that doesn't mean, or your partner, um, but that doesn't mean they necessarily feel loved. So it's important to recognize that too. You have now talked to so many women about this in your practice as a urologist that you're actually shifting what you're doing to make this more a part of the way that you help heal women and heal the world. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Yeah. So I started a podcast in January called You Are Not Broken. It's been so fulfilling because it's like you get to a point where just helping people one-on-one in clinic, you're like, I'm not going to make a difference. You know, people in Kentucky aren't going to know that they're normal. Right. Yeah. And so I started a podcast just to really reach out and to also have be a resource for other doctors and nurse practitioners to share with their patients because we're all busy and we don't always have, you know, all the time to talk, to dive into this. So to be a resource that people can refer people to has been a really fun thing. And now my my future dream is to kind of basically teach sex ed in a very sex positive, female empowering way and to coach on the brain because I think the brain is our biggest sex organ. And if we don't deal with the shame, the unwritten rules, the, you know, us thinking we're broken, if we don't deal with all of those big issues or what sex should be because it's not in my relationship, that kind of coaching on sex and that pleasure is important for women. Mm -hmm. Certainly we get taught like, you know, there was this Dove soap ad where like they're taking the shower and it's this best experience ever. And they're like, if we're telling women in America that like taking a shower is like (laughs) luxury for them, like what have we taught women about pleasure, right? So that's just like a basic bodily showering. And we're like, here, have this luxury. So I think the coaching on the mind is super important. And so basically, I'm just going to start doing classes so anybody can come in and see me and hang out with me and not in a medical. So I'm not a doctor and I'm not doing individual medical advice in those settings. But I I don't think you always need to see a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Um, just having somebody like, you know, people will be like, you're just kind of like my big sister who knows stuff about sex. I'm like, great. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and these coaching sessions you do individual as well as group. Is that right? Just group right now. Just group. Yep. Just group. And people can find you at your website, kellycaspersonmd.com and sign up. You've got groups upcoming. Yep. I've got a group starting September 21st. So it's going to be, it's going to, a lot of it's kind of a lecture didactic already pre pre-programmed and then we're going to do live group coaching and the power of group coaching is really watching somebody be coached and watching kind of how that mind switch changes can be very powerful for the observers can you give us a sense of some of the things you'll be talking about all of the everything above, right <laughs> yeah <laughs> So desire, anatomy, pleasure, mm-hmm. uh, the role of the of mindfulness in the brain and sex, sex okay. knots, the trouble sex. we get ourselves in. 
Let's talk about some of the kind of things that might not be common to everybody, but some of the unique things. Like, um, what are some side effects of birth control? Is there si- is, are there sex side effects to birth control? Yeah, not and again, not always, right? Like mm-hmm. medications affect everybody differently. But what oral ring more the oral birth control do, does is it basically makes the vulva be postmenopausal. So it basically kind of blocks the hormones down in the vulva and decreases testosterone too. Mm-hmm. And so in a normal cycle, women will get this kind of big sex drive mid when they're ovulating, which is kind of mother nature's way of being like, hey, a baby could be made. Why don't you go find some, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of gets muted with birth control. So women might notice a change in that sex drive because they're not having a normal cycle. And then also pain in the vulva can happen a lot more or decreased orgasm with birth control. Any other myths you want to bust for us today? About sex, about desire, about arousal, about the vulva? Hmm. Any more myths? I think we got them all. The myth of everybody should have orgasm at the exact same time. That's Hollywood. (laughs) That's totally fake. (laughs) I feel like anyone watching this who has any say in Hollywood, please give us a movie scene in which one person orgasms and then they keep going and then the other person may or may not orgasm. (laughs) How does like, let's get, have that alternative ending. Let's have the alternative ending where people don't orgasm, but they still have a really good time and it's a successful sexual experience. Totally. There was this this movie that just came out with Charlize Theron and I forget, and she's like this high powered woman and she ends up being in this relationship with this guy she babysat you know what i'm talking about oh Charlie yeah Sharon. um so not was it seth rogan yeah seth rogan yes. okay so like they're building up their sexual tension like this entire movie right uh-huh. and so they finally get it, they get it together and they both have a simultaneous orgasm within like 30 seconds and <laughs> <laughs> me and my like, you know, nerd alert people who are doing this with, you know, this kind of sex work with me that we're like, ah, Hollywood did it again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm like, in all fairness, they were having it like a three month long foreplay. Yeah. Well, yeah. And sometimes, you know, that can lead to very quick. Yeah. There's a lot of tension that yeah, needed to be tension. released. We've talked a lot about today about penis and vagina sex. But what about same-sex sexual experiences? So same-sex, so female same-sex relationships, they have a much higher rate of orgasmic equality. Mm -hmm. Uh, With about 86 in the study that did about 86% of women at the same amount. Mm -hmm. And really it's the heterosexual female that has the lowest amount of orgasms in in any relationship. We really should have put that at the beginning of this podcast. (laughs) If you stay (laughs) till the end of this podcast, there's your gem, orgasmic inequality. (laughs) And do, was it included for homosexual male? Oh, yeah. They're the highest. They're the highest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They, okay. they have orgasms all the time. <laughs> My God. So we could kind of extrapolate. If you want to have orgasms all the time, stick with your same sex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's, you know, there's so much to that of like, we don't get our own education on our own bodies, let alone right. the opposite sex bodies. Right. right? So, so I think gonna... the heterosexual relationship does have a little more trouble than it like, hey, I understand my female body. I'm going to understand your female body. Maybe not yeah. perfectly, but like more than like oh 86% gosh, got... of the time, 86% of the time, than like a, a whole different setup that, yeah. you know, you might have not gotten a good education on. So communication's key. Communication's key and really education. So, and exploration. So I think one of the things that I hope listeners take away from this is not only about the love languages, about how we connect outside of sexual experiences, but also about how within sexual experiences that we learn how to ask how we should be touching each other, that we should ask what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what people like one day may or may not be the thing that they like any other day of the life. And so that we need to really stay current to each other, see each other as sunsets, as, you know, as unique as a unique experience each time and that things that you do one time are just that one time but we really need to stay kind of attentive to the other as a person as opposed to attentive to each other as a penis or as a vagina yeah totally (laughs) and you know i think it's like the it's a double-edged sword because like if you get stressed out about sex that makes you have worse sex because stress is so bad for sex (laughs) so (laughs) it's now some people find stress relief in having orgasms but that's not everybody the a common thing is I'm stressed, therefore I can't have an orgasm because your body's like, there's a tiger, right? Yeah. There, there's stress yeah. in the room. So yeah. the more stressed out we are about it, it can be actually very counterproductive. Or high blood pressure, 
or pain, anatomical reasons, anatomical lichen sclerosis. So there can be some good reasons to see a urologist for urology services. Absolutely. Anything else you want to add today? I just want women to know that take back your power. You're totally yeah. in control. You were given an organ that's only for pleasure. So we don't have a lot of time here on earth. Use it. Use it. Yeah. Use your clitoris. Use Enjoy your clitoris. It. Use your whole body. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, this has been fantastic. We so appreciate you being on the show. And this has been such a great conversation. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I am excited for people to be able to take advantage of your services um, with your upcoming coaching programs and your group classes. Group sex classes sounds like um, uh, maybe it should be illegal, but I think- Right? It's all on Zoom <laughs> with clothes on. People do a lot of stuff like that online. Yeah, I bet they do. That's true. I bet they do. Oh yeah. Worse than, I mean, we should mention that worse than Hollywood ruining our sex lives, porn has absolutely hands down ruined our sex lives. I know. It's so sad, but it's not, porn is not going away. So we, you know, there's absolutely no way it's going away. So we just need to, you know, understand it and realize that it is a product and the product is designed to get people off as fast as possible. And so if you're like, okay, that just like Hollywood, it's not all reality. It's not reality. And it's not ultimately fulfilling. You know, we're really here to be with each other in person. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for listening today with Dr. Kelly Kasperson. We've got lots of ways to continue this conversation through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can get more information from and about us at our website, centerforhealingneurology.com, and more about Dr. Kasperson at kellykaspersonmd.com. Please be sure to share this show with your friends, any friends, especially those struggling with orgasm, intimacy, love languages, and sex. We welcome your rating and review wherever you get your podcasts, and feel free to send topic requests to podcast at centerforhealingneurology.com. We love that you've joined us today to discuss how to make our whole world medicine. We rise or fall together and are committed to doing what we can to make as many of us as healthy as possible. And this takes all of us, including you. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Media. Party Fish Media acknowledges that it operates and records on indigenous Duwamish and Puget Sound Coast Salish land that is still home to the Duwamish tribe. This land is stolen in violation of the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations who reside alongside us. For more information on this land, its people, or ways you can help, visit duwamishtribe.org or realrentduwamish.org.